はい、はい、あの、ブー。You are so much,、uh, Mr. Prime Minister, for not only coming here, but for sharing with us and doing so in such a personal manner. I think sometimes, you know, we see things on TV or we watch them on the internet, but we don't feel it as closely as, as we would if we were to experience it direct. And what you've shared is、uh, very, very, very powerful. So I want to thank you.、Um, I also want to tell folks that,、um, you know, this is、uh, streaming live. Supervisor、uh, Roberts just、uh, passed me a note, and there's about a、uh, thousand people watching live, but it's now being tweeted to 20,000 people. And,、um, <laughs> And that was a few minutes ago. So, you know, by the time we're done、uh, in a couple hours, it's going to be a whole lot more folks watching. And、uh, talking about what we can expect as we go forward, by about 11 o'clock or so, I want to see if we can't have a panel discussion. We'll go for 30 minutes. Then you'll get 30 minutes to ask us all questions. And so we have three speakers right now that,、uh, that we're going to be、um, uh, hearing from. Before we get to that 11 o'clock timetable,、uh, the first、uh, is going to be Gregory Jasko. And I think he's a very, very courageous man. And let me tell you why. He's sitting right next to the Prime Minister.、Um, that's not why he's courageous. He's courageous because of what he did. And let me tell you part of what he did.、Um, he was first sworn as commissioner of the U.S. Nu-、uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission on January 21st. Of、uh, 2005. Then on May 13th of 2009, President Obama designated him as the organization's chairman. So, when you're chair of the uh, uh, NRC, that's、uh, a very important position. And in that position, he was serving during the Fukuyama crisis. And he recommended that American citizens in Japan,、uh, 50 miles outside of Fukuyama, You know, be, uh, Fukushima be、uh, evacuated. And that was his recommendation when this was occurring. Then on February 9th of 2012, there was a vote that came before the NRC, and he became the lone dissenting vote. And that vote was a vote where they were going to look at uh, licensing uh, a new power plant, which has not been licensed in this country in over 30 years. And, and on that date, the NRC voted four to one, with Gregory uh, uh, Jasko being the only dissenting vote、um, to allow the Atlanta based Southern、uh, Company to build and operate two new nuclear power、uh, reactors、uh, at a site right outside of the city there in Georgia.、Um, and part of what he cited was that,、um, you know, that he could not support. Issuing this license as if Fukushima had never happened. In other words, let's go ahead and issue the license and learn no lessons from what occurred. And, and, and so, yes, we should applaud. So it, it is difficult to be a dissenting vote, but it is important to do what one believes to be right. And in this case, in essence, it cost him his seat on the NRC in the sense that.、Um, It caused so much friction with the other commissioners that, that he chose to move、uh, to a different capacity. And since he has been appointed as a post of the congressional panel overseeing the nuclear,、uh, National Nuclear Security Administration. So please join me in welcoming Gregory Jasko. Well, thank you.、Uh... Thank you, Mayor、uh, Polito, for that introduction.、Uh, I, I feel like that's better than what I was going to say, so I, I, I might not say anything. <laughs> I,、uh, it's a tremendous、uh, honor for me to be here、uh, in Southern California.、Uh, and I want to thank a few people、uh, before I begin. First of all, I, I want to thank、uh, Prime Minister Khan.、Uh, Not only for his leadership during the Fukushima accident, but really for his leadership afterwards.
and I also want to I want to thank uh, Mayor Polito and, and Supervisor Roberts for helping to organize this and, and inviting us here. Uh, in all the times that I visited Japan and with all the uh, efforts uh, related to the accident, uh, it um, this is the first time that I've I've sat next to Prime Minister Khan and. Uh, and so it, uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to be able to do that. And I want to thank everyone who, uh, who made that possible. And I, the, I do want to also thank uh, Torgan Johnson, who uh, called me up one day and said, um, I would love for you to be able to get together with Prime Minister Khan. And I said, sure. Um, and uh, I, I wasn't sure that that was ever going to happen. but. Um, but it did, and I, and I want to thank him for doing that, and I think it's uh, a wonderful thing that he was able to do. Uh, I, um, I also want to thank Friends of the Earth and, and Physicians for Social Responsibility who helped to organize. Uh, I know putting an event to, like this together takes a tremendous amount of work, so I, I thank everybody who, who was involved. Um, The accident in Fukushima was, was certainly nothing that I ever anticipated uh, happening. Uh, I woke up the morning of March 11th uh, with a call from uh, the Operations Center at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission telling me that uh, there had been an earthquake uh, in Japan. The uh, earthquake was a very large earthquake. Uh, and there was the potential, uh, as I was told at that time, that there could be a large tsunami associated with, uh, with, with uh, that earthquake. M months after the accident, uh, I was asked when I was first told about the accident and uh, where I was and what I was doing, and I couldn't really remember because uh, it wasn't that eventful what I was told at that very first phone call. The NRC at the beginning was most worried about plants here on the West Coast, uh, Diablo Canyon and San Onofre, because of the possibility of a tsunami. Uh, we were focused initially on uh, making sure that the tsunami, uh, when it hit the West Coast, didn't create any problems for plants in the United States. The accident, in fact, didn't create a large tsunami wave. It was well within the, the, the levels that, that could be expected. But it, it did certainly have significant ramifications for, uh, for how we look at nuclear power uh, in this country. Um, so I want to spend a little bit of time talking about my thoughts uh, about how I think we should look at nuclear power after this accident. Uh, and of course, it's always easier looking back to, to be right and to be better. Um, but that doesn't prevent you from doing things and from needing to take action. The, the first important lesson that I think we need to remember and think about uh, is that accidents do happen. Uh, that's a very cliche phrase, uh, but it's something that we need to remember and we need to keep in mind. As I was learning about the accident in Fukushima, I often would ask the staff of the NRC why we weren't thinking of that or why we hadn't prepared for that or why we weren't uh, ready to deal with something like that. Uh, and sometimes the answer was we had thought about it, but we didn't think it was, it was uh, going to happen or we thought it was so unlikely that it would happen that we, we couldn't require people to take action and, and to do something uh, to address it. Uh, I think that's a very, very important lesson and uh, that the accidents do happen. And so it, it led me to begin to think a little bit more about nuclear power and how we deal with safety of nuclear power plants. And my thinking evolved significantly uh, after the accident and during the accident. And I thought it was very important that we begin to look at not just the likelihood of something happening, but to focus more extensively on what can happen and what goes wrong. In most of the requirements for nuclear power plants in this country, uh, they are required to deal with accidents. 
uh, and to deal with certain accident scenarios. But not all plants are required to deal with some of the most severe accident scenarios. And that creates a bit of a challenge uh, because when you get a very severe kind of situation like a large earthquake uh, followed by a very large tsunami, you wind up putting the plant in a configuration it was not designed to deal with. And it, as uh, Prime Minister Khan said, in general, nuclear power plants can be shut down, but they don't easily turn off. There are natural radioactive decay processes that need to happen uh, that take time, and they take additional cooling uh, methods to address. The accidents that are looked at for nuclear power plants don't always consider all of the, those scenarios in which you have a very damaged uh, process, you have a very damaged cooling system. In that case, the plants are not designed naturally to be able to, to cool and lead to the kinds of severe accidents that, that we saw at Fukushima. Where I think we have such important lessons to learn is that we have known that for a long time. Uh, people uh, familiar with nuclear power and, and the technical experts understand that when you lose electric power for a long period of time, uh, it's something we call a station blackout event, that that will almost always lead you to a large release of radiation. But what was missing was the appreciation that that could in fact happen. Uh, and for many people, what happened at Fukushima was a wake-up call. Uh, that this scenario which had been looked at and postulated but always believed to be of such low probability that it did not need to be addressed uh, could in fact happen. So the, the other big issue that I think we need to look at and think about is the role of probability in looking at accidents and how we think about that and how we think about uh, that in terms of risk. It's very difficult to, uh, to try and figure out in a finite world with finite resources where you can best put your, resource, your resources to make things better. Nuclear power plants are no different. So a lot of methodologies were developed over the years uh, under the name of risk analysis to try and figure out how do we best allocate resources? Where should we put finite dollars in a way that maximizes our ability to do good things, to enhance safety, to make things better? And over the years, that risk analysis was largely developed to deal with nuclear power plant accidents, to try and give a perspective for accidents relative to other kinds of hazards. But I think over time, what, what has happened is that because those exercises were so theoretical in nature, uh, it was very difficult for them to be applicable in practical decision making. So over the years, we began to rely more and more on the fact that things were not likely to happen, and as a result, we didn't need to spend money to address them. Clearly, the accident of Fukushima told us otherwise. And if there's nothing more significant to think about, it's, it's the cost of the accident itself. Uh, a recent assessment that was done by the American Nuclear Society, which is a very credible organization made up of nuclear professionals, uh, estimated in a report that they did following the accident that the overall cost, including economic costs, loss of activity, uh, the loss of, of viable um, use of, of, of land, is approximately $500 billion. And I'm sorry, I'm, the reason I'm pausing is so the translation can happen. So I th apologize for, for, for those of you, but it's, I think it's important for them to be able to keep up. They do a lot of work to do this translation. It's not easy. Um, the $500 billion is a tremendous sum, and, and that is only a minimum, uh, and it depends largely on how long uh, nuclear power stays offline in Japan. Likely that cost estimate would go up the longer they, they stay in the, in the current configuration. 
So when we're dealing with nuclear power plants, what we're dealing with is a situation in which you have very unlikely events that can have very, very significant consequences. And what I've come to realize is that the usual ways of ana analyzing this with risk analysis is not very useful. Because most of the time, things don't happen and things don't go wrong. But when the one thing does that nobody can predict because it surprises everyone, the consequences are tremendous. So as the accident developed and as we began to learn more and more, one of the lessons that I, I understood and began to believe more than anything was that we had to pay much, much greater attention to the consequences of an accident, to the economic impact, and to the personal hardship that can be placed on people. Unfortunately, that is very difficult to put into numbers. It's very difficult to design regulations around that. So there has been a lot of resistance to thinking more about doing those things. And when I was at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, there was resistance uh, to, to looking more significantly at these kinds of things. And I think that's a mistake, and I think it's unfortunate that we have not done more uh, to consider those aspects of, of nuclear accidents. The, and I would like to tell you a very personal story, if I, if I could, about, I think, how these accidents play out and what it means for people uh, in, in, in Japan and throughout the world. I was uh, in the role as chairman uh, tasked with helping uh, the U.S. government deal with a response to, to the accident in Japan, tasked with helping lead um, the NRC in dealing with the aftermath in the United States, and tasked with helping lead a group of people who went to Japan to help provide assistance and recommendations to the Japanese uh, government. After I left my job as, as chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, I was invited to go to, uh, to, to Japan. And I went to visit uh, with some people who had been evacuated uh, from uh, the site around Fukushima. And I think it's very, it was a very uh, significant experience for me because it is very easy uh, in the position of chairman to look at numbers to look at all of these issues in a very objective and uh, 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 simple manner. But when I was in Japan, I met with a family who had been evacuated from uh, the Fukushima site. And it was a, a grandmother and a grandfather. And they showed me a picture on the wall of their children and grandchildren. Uh, and I recently had a son. Uh, not before I went on this trip, but after the trip. And the importance of family is something that's very, very significant for people. And this person told me that before he evacuated, he lived in the same town as his children and his grandchildren. Uh, after the accident, they all moved to different places. He was living with his wife in, in a temporary uh, housing area. Uh, but his children and grandchildren uh, had had to move to another area for jobs, for work, to, to, uh, to continue on with their life. These are not often the stories that we hear um, about this accident. But these are, in the end, the people who are most affected by the accident. So as we think about nuclear power plants, what we need to think about is ways that we can prevent that situation from happening, and not prevent it in a probability way, but prevent it in an absolute way. Now, I think that there are ways to do that. I think that there are ways to design nuclear power plants to be able to meet that criteria. I think that would be difficult, it would be costly, and it would be expensive. But if nuclear is going to be a, an energy source that is used, I think we have to finally make the rules such that there will never be another evacuation from a nuclear power plant accident. 
not a low likelihood of, of no evacuation, but no evacuation. And in many ways, the rules around nuclear power plants say that, but not in all cases. In some cases, they are the plants are designed to make sure that you don't have accidents that can lead to evacuations. But in other cases, that, that does not exist. So as we look at the lessons, that is, I think, one of the most significant lessons, is the, the importance of considering the economic consequences and the economic impact uh, of an accident. Now, I will say that as we look at the current fleet of nuclear reactors in this country, I think it's very important that we appreciate in the United States that many of the plants that we have are aging. Uh, that these plants, many of them were designed over 60 years ago, 50 to 60 years ago. The technology is very old and it's very outdated. And I think it's time that we begin to reconsider prolonging the lifetime of many of these reactors. Over the years, the process of reviewing and uh, extending the licenses of nuclear power plants has been focused on a very narrow set of issues. I think if we were to look more broadly at re-examining each reactor based on a modern set of, of safety standards, that in many cases we would see plants that would no longer be able to be licensed and to operate. Now, I don't think that's going to happen um, in, in this country, but I think it's something that we should seriously, uh, seriously consider. So as we look at the, at the impacts of the accident, I think it's very important to keep in mind, as I said, just to summarize a number of very important lessons. One is that accidents do happen. Uh, I once looked up the word accident. Uh, it comes from the Latin, uh, and I studied Latin a long time ago, so my Latin isn't very good. Um, but it comes from the Latin verb to happen. Uh, and over the years, um, that word has come to mean accident. Uh, the Latin root is really happens or happenings or, or things that will happen. Uh, and, and that's, of course, that's what accidents are. Accidents do happen. And it's important for us to learn that lesson. I think many people in the nuclear industry after the Fukushima accident did learn that lesson. I think many people did not. I think in this country in particular, there are a number of people who continue to believe that the accident was isolated to Japan and that the impacts are not uh, to be felt in the United States. My experience is that that is very, very far from the truth. There are, in fact, significant lessons uh, for the U.S. plants. While I was chairman, uh, I led uh, the creation of a task force to examine lessons for nuclear power plants in the United States. There were 12 major lessons that were identified. Uh, number one, uh, one of those, a very significant one, was that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission needed to stop using voluntary initiatives on the part of the industry as a replacement for regulations. And many of the things that, that failed uh, in the plants in Japan were elements of reactor design that were voluntary uh, requirements in the United States. And I, I was proud of the fact that during my time at the NRC, we changed a number of those and made some things binding uh, requirements uh, on nuclear power plants. But many of those 12 recommendations are still uh, to be addressed and still uh, to be fully implemented. But so I think as we go forward, it's vital that we continue to focus on implementing those 12 recommendations uh, and make sure that nuclear power plants that are continuing to operate uh, do so uh, with the full benefit and the full implementation of the lessons that we learned from the accident in Fukushima. Finally, I just want to touch on, uh, on an issue that did come up during my time as chairman, and that is how do we deal with new, the licensing of new nuclear reactors in, in the United States. Currently, there are four plants being constructed uh, in the southeastern part of the United States. I did not support the licensing of those reactors. Uh, I did not support them because I believe that we had not yet fully implemented uh, the, license, uh, the, the lessons from Fukushima. And I thought that before we move forward, it was vital that each of those designs was modified and corrected 
to address all of those recommendations that I mentioned to you that were identified uh, uh, by uh, a very select group of staff at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Given that we had not completed that work, I did not think it was appropriate to move forward uh, with licensing of those of those reactors until we had completed that work. As as you heard from uh, Mayor Polito, that I was not supported by my colleagues on the commission, uh, but it is still what I feel was the right decision. Uh, and I do worry that as those plants continue to be built and constructed, they will begin operating before all of the lessons have been implemented from Fukushima in the United States. And I think that sends a very bad signal about uh, the importance of implementing those recommendations and the speed and the effort at which uh, we need to do that. So I just want to close uh, on a some somewhat of a positive note. Um, I uh, never thought that I would be in the middle of a nuclear uh, crisis uh, as I was. Uh, but one of the things that I did see during that crisis was the true courage that resides within al almost all people. I saw the courage of Prime Minister Khan as he dealt with a very difficult situation in Japan. I saw the courage of, of the Japanese people as they recovered from what was a tremendous, tremendous tragedy in their country, and not just the nuclear accident, but the tsunami itself. And I, I have seen many people who have stood up and who have said what they believed and what they have fought for. And I've seen many people stand with me as I did what I believed and what I thought was right. And I have developed strong bonds with people in Japan who have dealt with this. And throughout this, I have just been reminded repeatedly of the courage of the human spirit to overcome obstacles and to overcome hardship and tragedy. And as difficult as the accident in Japan was and the tsunami was, I have seen and been inspired by the people there as they have moved to recover and move forward and address their future in a brighter way. And I think that is perhaps the greatest lesson that we can all take from what happened there is the resilience of the, those people to deal with, with the tragedy and to move forward and to continue on uh, with, with their lives. So uh, again, I thank everybody um, for uh, inviting me to be here. And, and I'm really thrilled. And I look forward to the discussion and the questions that we'll have. Thank you.